A lot of viewers ask about cholesterol-lowering supplements like red yeast rice or phytosterols. And a brand new trial just came out looking at those, so let's take a look. They compared a statin to several different types of supplements side by side. And they also had a placebo group, so people taking an inert pill as a reference. By the way, I don't make any money from any of these products. I think regular viewers already know this. I don't make money from statins or any other drug. I don't sell supplements. We don't make any commercial deals on the channel. So I don't have a horse in this race. So in this trial, rosuvastatin, that's the statin they used, lowered LDL cholesterol by about 35% compared to the group given the placebo. LDL cholesterol was 133 milligrams per deciliter average before the trial. It came down by 46 points, so to about 86 milligrams per deciliter average. So that's a substantial drop. On the other hand, most supplements had no statistically significant effect. Phytosterols lowered LDL cholesterol by about 4% and red yeast rice by about 6%, but neither was statistically significant compared to the placebo. And the statin also lowered total cholesterol and triglycerides. Now, this trial was funded by the pharmaceutical industry, so a lot of people asked about that. So this is another opportunity to address this common question and these concerns with pharma and funding. What we said in previous videos is we don't dismiss scientific studies based on funding alone. We still have to scrutinize them, we still have to assess them scientifically, and importantly, we have to look at balance of evidence. What else is known on this topic in this field? And does the new study align with that prior data, or is it an outlier? And of course, we still have to go through this appraisal process regardless of funding source. Even if the investigators pay the, for the research out of pocket, we still got to do it. This is why I tend to not pay too much attention to funding because it doesn't really change this process. But that said, if people want to note funding source, I don't have a problem with that. As long as we don't fall in the trap of starting to dismiss results we don't like because of funding. I sometimes see people on social media dismissing entire bodies of evidence, entire fields that don't agree with their views based on some vague funding concern. And that's a massive red flag. So we don't want to fall into that. So are the findings of this new trial believable? Are there any caveats? I see two main sources of uncertainty and both have to do with dosage. I'm just wondering if maybe a different dose would work. And so we can't take the results of the trial and extrapolate to say that the supplements don't work, period. The second caveat, which is related, is whether the supplements they used actually contain the amount of the molecules written on the box. Some trials actually measure the amount of the active ingredients, and that's fantastic, but that's not the norm from what I've seen, and this one did not do that. And we know this is a problem with supplements because they're very loosely regulated, and so there's massive variation in the market. The active ingredients in red yeast rice are called monocolins, the main one being monocolin K. And some studies have found a 100-fold difference in the content of monocolin K between different commercial products, even though they were all labeled with the same dose of red yeast rice. Unfortunately, most of the studies that I've seen that do this type of measurements don't disclose which products exactly they're looking at, they're usually coded. But here's an example of a study that both measured monocolon K content and disclosed the source. They used a red yeast rice formulation called DIF1STAT from Diffus International in Italy, and they confirmed it contained monocolon K. This is not me recommending this company. I don't know anything about them. I'm not affiliated in any way. I'm just sharing the information I've seen. Also, this trial is from 2017. And there are some recent developments in European legislation that may change everything, and we'll touch on that in a minute. So I went back and looked at other trials that have been conducted looking at these supplements to see how this new one compares. For example, this large analysis looked at 20 randomized controlled trials using red yeast rice. And in average, it did lower LDL cholesterol by about 40 points, 40 milligrams per deciliter. So that's similar to the effect of statins seen in the newer trial. And in fact, in this older analysis, that cholesterol-lowering effect of red yeast rice was not significantly different from the cholesterol-lowering effect of statin. A different meta-analysis also showed an effect of red yeast rice. It lowered LDL cholesterol by about 28 points average. Okay, so why is the new trial giving us a different result? Some people might go, aha, so it was the funding after all. We should go back and dismiss studies based on funding. Unfortunately, it's not that simple because some of the studies that show an effect of supplements are funded by the supplement industry. 
right? So there's no way around it. We have to always do the scientific assessment. So the doses the different trials are aiming for are not that different. If anything, the dose in the new trial is higher than a lot of the older trials that did work. So my main suspicion is my second caveat from earlier, that maybe the supplement they used didn't contain the amount that it said on the package. And the older trials generally report how much monoclonal MK was included in the supplements they used, but this new trial doesn't mention it. So maybe they used a supplement that didn't report monoclonal MK content, and maybe it included very little. So we might conclude, oh, so the new trial is trash, and we just ignore it, but it actually gives us really important information. It's a really important cautionary tale because it drives home this idea that the effect of the supplement can vary dramatically depending on where we get our bottle. We'll come back to this idea in a minute, but first, let's take a look at the phytosterol supplements. I also found some prior evidence of efficacy for phytosterols. In this analysis of clinical trials, phytosterols lowered LDL cholesterol by about 8 to 10% average, which amounted to 12 points, 12 milligrams per deciliter. And the dose of phytosterols used was about 1.6 grams a day, which is the same dose as the new trial. This actually makes total sense because the new trial was statistically powered to pick up a 15% or larger effect on LDL cholesterol. So this 8 to 10% seen in older trials of phytosterols wouldn't make the cut. It wouldn't reach statistical significance. So phytosterols probably do lower cholesterol. It's just a mild effect. Quick caveat regarding phytosterol supplements. Some people are hyper absorbers of sterols in the intestine. They absorb a large amount. And for those people, phytosterol supplements are not a good idea. They can cause problems. We actually covered this recently with Dr. Tom Dayspring. So for more details, check out that video. Another option on the market is called a stanol, which is a slightly different molecule. It has a similar effect in the intestine to the phytosterols, but it doesn't get absorbed. So it's safer for those people. Two last caveats regarding supplements. The first one is safety. Most available evidence looking at red yeast rice points to a pretty low level of adverse effects, of side effects, but most of those trials are pretty short. They're mainly looking at LDL cholesterol changes, and they last for a few weeks, a few months, maybe. And so there's a, a certain level of uncertainty regarding long-term intake. And in fact, some of the meta-analyses voice this concern. And second caveat, at the end of the day, what we really care about are outcomes. Does the risk come down, the risk of the cardiovascular risk, the risk of actual heart attacks and strokes and death? That's the standard by which, by which medication is evaluated, like statins and other meds. We look for a reduction of risk, not just a reduction of cholesterol. I've only seen one trial looking at red yeast rice and actual risk, so a long-term outcome trial. It was carried out in China, where they used this extract of red yeast rice called however you pronounce that, Chui Ji Kang, Chui Ji Kang, Chui Ji Kang, Chui Ji Kang. 10,000 Chinese viewers just went, unsubscribe. Their results were actually really encouraging. After four years, people taking that extract had lower risk of coronary events like heart attacks and even lower death. And this was an older population with a history of heart attacks, so it was secondary prevention. So from the evidence I've seen, I think red yeast rice is interesting um, it could potentially be a viable option if you were regulated and uh, standardized and maybe had more outcome trials validating it. I'm not going to speculate on why it isn't or isn't approved and regulated, whether it's financial interest from Big Pharma or the FDA, but I'm sure those conversations are going to be going on in the comments. To add more fuel to the fire, it seems the FDA considers it illegal to sell red yeast rice products if they contain significant monocolon K, because they consider it a drug, not a supplement. And in fact, they have tried to clamp down on companies selling it. In Europe, monocolon K is also being restricted. New legislation just came out this year restricting the dosage. Honestly, I don't know what effect all of these measures are gonna have, because nowadays people get everything online anyway from all over the world. And I did a quick Google search and I found several supplements advertising substantial amounts of monocolon K, whether they really contain it or not, is another story. So that's the bulk of the evidence uh, I've seen on this topic. Hopefully that helps you make some educated decisions. I don't really like to tell people what to do or what they have to do. It's not really my style. I can tell you what I would do 
if I had high cholesterol. If I'm not at very high risk, so relatively young, healthy overall, no history of heart disease, but cholesterol is a bit high, first and foremost, I would lower it with lifestyle. And we have like a hundred videos on that. All right, maybe not a hundred, but like eight or nine. If that doesn't get me quite where I wanna be, I like to see my LDL cholesterol and my ApoB under 80 milligrams per deciliter. Different doctors, different lipidologists might have different thresholds. If the lifestyle alone doesn't get me quite there, might I play around with a stanol or with a red yeast rice that isn't a crazy high dose that reports monocolon K content? Maybe. And if that pushes me another 10 or 20 points, cool, but I'm not gonna bet the farm on those. If I have very high ApoB, if I have very high risk, if I've had a heart attack before or a stroke, or if I have angina, or if I have extensive plaque shown in imaging, or a high calcium score, or like a crazy family history or something like that, I wouldn't play any games. I would go straight to something that is regulated and has more outcome and safety data. In terms of not knowing how much is in the supplement, I guess I could just measure my blood work. And if the cholesterol comes down after I take the supplement, that's a good sign. But because it's not regulated, how do I know the next batch isn't gonna be a lower dose or somewhere down the line, they change the process and the, the, the supplement changes. Yeah, I guess I could keep measuring routinely and keep an eye on that. It's kind of a pain in the backside. Another thing to bear in mind is monocolon K is essentially a statin. The chemical structure is the same as lovastatin. They're the same molecule. And the physiological effect is the same. Monocolon K inhibits the same step of cholesterol synthesis as statins do. Now, of course, red yeast rice is not just pure monocolon K. It contains other components. And some of the concerns over safety are related to those. If this was 20 years ago and I have a statin intolerance and I can't be on a statin, yeah, I would consider red yeast rice as an alternative. But now that we have all these options with outcome trials, with safety data long-term, ZMI, BCSK9 inhibitors, all these things coming out, if I'm at risk, I would focus on those. So that's me. Let me know your thoughts below. And also, if you have experience with some of these supplements, please share with everybody. Here's the video with Dr. Day Spring on phytosterols, and here's some more information on statins. I'll catch you guys next week. Peace.